We do. Uh, we do. We build instruments for rockets, uh, generally looking at the uh, at, at, at energetic electrons and ions uh, in the aurora. Uh, these energetic electrons are actually what produce the visible aurora, and we we, we make measurements of the the energy flux uh, coming in uh, for uh, understanding the the uh, what energizes the aurora. Uh, in addition, there's also a lot of interesting uh, effects that that occur because of these energetic ions that are, are electrons that are streaming down uh, produce a lot of electromagnetic waves. Um, activity that's that's very relevant to physics is going on, uh, you know, at, at other planets at, in, the, in the solar atmosphere, um, in st other stellar atmospheres. So it's it's a very good uh, laboratory in space. Uh, that's very easily accessed, uh, whereas doing the measurements at the sun or other stars is, is virtually impossible. Um, the, the, these are suborbital rockets, so the payload goes up and comes back down. Doesn't never makes it to orbit, but makes it up to an altitude that's sufficiently high to make these measurements. Um, it's cheaper that way. Uh, most of the motors that are used to, to launch these rockets are actually surplus military. No longer used by the military, so they they sell them fairly cheaply to NASA, and, and NASA makes use of launch range of Wallops Island, Virginia. Uh, that's the home base of the, of the sounding rocket program. Uh, generally, we launch the ones for the Aurora from Poker Flat, Alaska, and from um, uh, Andoya, Norway. It's a uh, what has been called a top hat uh, electrostatic analyzer. And the reason it's called the top hat is, is essentially it's two hemispheres, uh, concentric hemispheres, where a small section of the upper hemisphere has been lifted up, much like you would lift up a top hat. If, you, if you're wearing a top hat and you greet somebody, you're supposed to lift your top hat. That's the way it got its name. It's, um, but anyway, that, that lifting of that small section there allows a break in the, uh, in the uh, curved uh, surfaces here where particles will enter that. And we apply a voltage between the two uh, surfaces. And that voltage, depending on the energy of the particle coming in, curves that particle around. If, if, the, ener if the, particle has, the charged particle has too much energy, it will actually not curve around enough and impact the outer wall. And if it has too little energy, it gets pulled into the inner wall and, and gets absorbed. But if it has the right energy, it'll, it'll track through that curved plate and then down to the microchannel plates. We'll put a pair of the, the microchannel plates, uh, amplify it up, put a, a charge sensitive amplifier on the other side, and we'll actually get that, that uh, indication. And that gives us a, a small angular, gives us a, a, a nice angular window. Um, the other, the advantage of this design is in the, in the Earth's, uh, uh, in the Earth, because we have such a strong magnetic field uh, at the Earth, the, the particles are aligned uh, to the magnetic field. So there's a, a symmetry about the magnetic field that we can take advantage of. That way we don't have to have a full three, uh, 3D uh, view of it. We only need a 2D view as long as this, this, the magnetic field aligns within that plane. Uh, we can get a, a full understanding of the uh, distribution of the particles along the magnetic field. We won't have any of the high voltage on. Uh, and that's more because of the transition from an atmosphere to a vacuum. Uh, we'll go through the uh, the corona region where you'd get uh, a lot of breakdown uh, uh, if, if the voltage is sufficiently high. So we keep the high voltage off. Once we reach uh, space, once we get to the vacuum, we turn the high voltage on and start getting uh, recording data. This is this is an example of some of the data. This is data that is is um, aligned to the to the uh, the magnetic field within 15 to 30 degrees as a function of energy and time. And this is actually an aurora event. There's this, this flux of energetic particles that are coming down. It's impacting the atmosphere. It's, it's exciting the, uh, the oxygen atoms in the atmosphere uh, and the upper atmosphere. And that's what's producing the light that, that is seen with the aurora. Actually, here's images of the aurora that we flew through at two different altitudes and, and the dots up here indicate where the rockets were at various points in time relative to this ground-based image of the aurora. Usually it's, it's maybe two or three institutions. Uh, 
each institution uh, focusing more on what their expertise are. Uh, within our group, we do the, the charged particle measurements. We often team with a group from Dartmouth that does electric field measurements. Um, in this case, we teamed with a group from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, did a magnetometer for us. A group from the University of New Hampshire did a low energy particle uh, that doesn't use any amplification, um, but it, it looks at the lower energy of, uh, particles. And uh, let's see, a group from Goddard Space Flight Center who did the uh, who did the DC electric fields and uh, also provided a impedance probe which measures the density of the plasma. As an electron source, um, will sweep through various energies of, of the electron to calibrate the detector. So you test uh, all the detectors before you put them on the we, rocket, we right? We test them in here before you, because uh, we, we can't test them in atmosphere because of the high voltage. <laughs> we can't test them in atmosphere because of the high voltage, so uh, we throw them in here before we deliver them to the rocket. These uh, coils here actually negate out the magnetic field uh, because charged particles uh, like to like to uh, gyrate around magnetic fields. Uh, when we get to low, because of the strong field that you know here on the ground at Earth, um, when we calibrate the sensor, anything above say 500 eV in energy, uh, we'd, we'd be able to calibrate just fine. But when we got to lower energies, the magnetic field started to influence the, the trajectory of the uh, electrons. So we want to uh, before we shield the whole thing and a material called mu metal, which is supposed to shield out the magnetic field, but it's not perfectly efficient. And with the odd shape of the chamber, it wasn't doing a great job. We came across these that had been built for another group, uh, an old uh, a group that's no longer active at the university. And so we got this from their chamber, applied it to ours, and now we use, you know, we drive current through here, we'll, we'll essentially null out the Earth's field uh, with this. Uh, which allows us to go to much lower energies, get down below 100 EV to, to do our calibrations. The big questions now in the Aurora is um, how how does these the, these uh, it, these energetic electrons uh, represent a current that is that is going uh, actually out of the atmosphere, um, out of the Earth's uh, atmosphere and ionosphere. There is a return current, since all currents must close, there's a return current that exists that actually is, is produced by low energy electrons moving up the, the field lines back into space. Um, and how this current system closes, both in the Earth's ionosphere and way out in, in the other end, um, what we call the magnetosphere, or the Earth's sphere of magnetic influence. Uh, so how these current systems close, how, how these currents are driven is uh, still, uh, there are a lot of questions. There, there are various mechanisms uh, at play here, trying to understand what mechanisms are involved. Um, likewise, as I said earlier, there was, there's also the advantage that the, a lot of these same processes are going on in stellar atmospheres, the sun and other planets. Uh, which would be more expensive to send remote uh, instrumentation to those locations, or if, if at all possible. Uh, so studying the mechanisms here uh, actually provide a lot of information. We, we launched a rocket where instead of actually looking at what was driving the, uh, these energetic electrons, we actually were making measurements of the energetic electrons and how they produced electromagnetic waves. Uh, so that it basically it works both ways. There's an understanding of, of what's going on physically within a, our system here, which then relates to other systems at other planets and on the solar atmosphere, as well as effects that are produced because you have this energetic energetic uh, electron moving through a background plasma. It produces electromagnetic waves, which is also going on at other locations. It also has some uh, application in um, the, the fusion field because that is, in case, a, a plasma. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, general uh, 
processes that are going on that, that uh, we can learn learn from. Uh, and the advantage of the the advantage of the space environment is that the scales are much larger compared to the detector, whereas on Earth and in laboratory plasmas, the scales are very small. And there's a there's a limit to how small the detectors can get. Uh, we just went through a minimum. Uh, actually, the activity was really low uh, for one of our last rockets. We saw very little aurora. Uh, it, it stayed lower than most people expected. Uh, it was only recently started to. Go.